All right, let's now talk about how we can modify multilayer perceptrons to capture sequence information. So in particular, we are going to talk about sequence modeling with recurrent neural networks. So, but before we get to that, how can we tell whether our model already uses sequence information? So for instance, if you think of logistic regression or multilayer perceptrons, do these types of models actually use sequence information? So the answer is no. And how can you know? I mean, there are two ways or two types of sequence information that might be encoded in our training set. One type is across the training example axis and the other type is across the feature axis. So uh, maybe to illustrate that, let's revisit the iris data set. I know talking about iris is a little bit boring, but I think it's a nice, simple data set to illustrate these types of problems. So in iris, what we had, we had, um, let's call that sepal length, um, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. So we have this tabular data set. And we have the training examples, like 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 150. Now, when you have this data set, and so that, let's say this is your data set and you split it into a training set and a test set and then you train the model on this training set let's call it train and then test you can shuffle actually all the records in the test set so you assume of course also this is shuffled because um, you want before you split in iris, usually you have uh, the 50 first flowers are setosa, the second 50 are ruginica, and the third 50 are versicolor. So let's assume you split them in a way that they are equally distributed now in the training and test set. But now, given the test set, you can actually shuffle all the records in the test set. And when you evaluate your model on the test set, you should still get the same performance. So this um, is kind of like a way of saying the model doesn't really use any sequence information. It regards the, or considers the data as so-called IID. IID means um, that the data is independent and identically distributed. So this means that each training record is independent of each other. So it has been sampled independently and also um, it's from the same distribution. So distribution of flowers, um, or iris flowers. So how to tell whether your model uses um, sequence information across the training axis is really by, let's say, doing this thought experiment of shuffling the test set. And you can, of course, yeah, probably tell that whether you shuffle the test set or not, the performance of the model should be exactly the same on that test set if you use multilayer perceptrons or logistic regression. Another type of sequence information might be encoded in the features, right? So the order here of the features. So what you can also think about is if what happens if you swap columns. So let's say you use this, this original iris data set with these columns here. Then you train the model on this data set and then you test it. Let's say you get 90% accuracy. Now, let's say, just out of fun, you are swapping these two columns here, like a sepal length and petal width. Now, in your modified data set, you have, um, let's say, petal width here and sepal length here. And then, again, you split this the same way into training and test, like you did before, using the same records for each data set. Now, if you train the model and test it, you should get exactly the same 90% accuracy. You can try this in practice. You will find the model performance should be exactly the same. And this is because, let's say, uh, multilayer perceptrons and logistic regression, they don't use sequence information in across the features. They regard the features as uh, independent here. So uh, in that way, they don't have to occur in a certain order. And if the features occur in a certain order, this uh, information is ignored. This is because, I mean, you can simply test this by swapping columns and then training the model on the data set with the swapped columns and testing it on a data set with swapped columns. And you will find there is no difference. This can be a problem though, when you 
think back of our back of words model. So the back of words model had this um, vocabulary and it essentially gets rid of the word order in each um, training example in the feature vector. So if you think of an example here where I have written down a, just a spontaneous sentence saying the movie my friend has not seen is good. This is of course different than the movie my friend has seen is not good. So two different meanings. So first meaning is in the first sentence that the friend has not seen a movie which is good and in the second one it has seen the friend has seen the movie but the movie is not good so here we have a good movie and here we have a not uh, let's say a bad movie so two different sentences but if we would use the back of words model where we have the text as the word frequency this would go get lost because both both sentences would result in the exactly same feature vector. So in this case, we have this um, between uh, in the inputs here and the features, we have this ordering information that it really depends um, it really depends in which order words occur. So not seen is very different from not good. Like the, the ordering really matters here. So and recurrent neural networks can help us capture this ordering information. Yeah, and here are some examples of sequence data. For example, text classification, which is something we will be focusing on in this lecture, especially at the end when I show you a PyTorch example. So here in the text data set, you can think of each, so the time dimension over the words. So you have texts, let's say T1, T2, like well, maybe T is a bit confusing because it's T for time. Let's say um, document, D1, document D2, and each document is a text. So you have the um, time dimension over the words, and then you have also had yeah, different training examples. So each document would be one training example, for example. And yeah, also something like speech recognition, there you have a sequence of sounds or language translation, which translates from one sequence into another sequence. There's also yeah, stock market prediction, which is a common and popular problem. So in stock market prediction, you can think of maybe each um, each stock at a data point as a training example. So you have stock one, stock two, and then you have the um, prices or you have a feature vector. Let's say a feature vector could be the price, but it could also be the sentiment or some news information, some, some type of feature vector. It's called F1, F2, F3. F1, F2, F3. So you have a feature vector for each time step where here the time dimension would be, let's say, um, the time of the day or something. Or the date, the day itself, or the month, or something like that. So the time dimension would be here uh, really like literally time, whereas in text data the time dimension would be just the order of the words. So time, using time is a little bit loose, so we can also just more think of it as a sequence. Another example here would be DNA uh, or sequence modeling. So instead of just thinking of text and words, you can also think of a DNA sequence. So here um, it's by character, for example. All right, so these are just a few examples. Now let's get to the part where we actually talk about how an RNN looks like. So previously we worked with um, so-called feed-forward neural networks. So our, um, our multilayer perceptrons or convolution networks, logistic regression, they were all cases of feed-forward neural networks. So we had usually an input vector, feature vector x, then some in the multilayer perceptron case or convolution case, some hidden layers, and then outputs. So now in the recurrent neural network setup, that's why it's called recurrent, we have this recurrent edge. So what's new here is we have a time step t and we get a feature vector at a time step t, give it to the hidden state and then uh, it results in an output at time step t. But in addition to that, instead of for this hidden layer only receiving the input here, but it additionally is, receives, it's also receiving the input from 
the previous time steps, for example, t minus 1 and so forth. So it's also yeah, receiving previous information from previous time steps. So it's maybe a little bit more clear to show it like this, and this is also how it's usually implemented. It's the unfolded state of this um, single layer recurrent neural network I was showing you on the previous slide. So this is again what I showed you on the previous slide, and we have this recurrent edge, and we can actually unroll this network. So if we have a sequence, let's say consisting of um, three time steps, then we can un unroll it like this. So given a time step t, let's focus, yeah, let's focus on this time step t in the center. So it receives the feature vector at time t, which results in the hidden state t, and this uh, results in the output. But in addition to that, this time step also receives the input from the previous layer. Uh, not layer, sorry, from the previous time step. So you can see there is this time connection. There are now two inputs. One input is from the sequence input, from the x. This is our feature vector here. At time step t. And this is the hidden state of the previous time step, which is um, t minus 1. So here, this allows the network being aware of the order of the sequence, right? And then this, um, this one here is passed then in the next step to t plus 1 and so forth. So here on the right hand side, also both, both they are equivalent, so it's the same network, it's just a different way of showing the network. This is just showing the compact notation with this recurrent edge, but in practice usually we use the unfolded version, the right hand side, it's just a different way of showing it, and that's also how we would implement it in code. So here, this was showing you on the previous slide a single layer recurrent neural network, but of course we can also extend this concept to multi-layer recurrent neural networks. I will also show you some examples later in code. So here we have now two hidden layers. So the same concept applies that for each hidden layer we have this recurrent edge here. So when we unfold it again, you can see this one here is receiving now the input from its previous hidden layer in the same time step, and also the input from the same layer from t minus 1. Yeah, and this is yeah, the general setup of how a recurrent neural network looks like. Um, yeah, so just to emphasize again, each hidden unit receives two inputs. So if we focus on this unit, it receives an input from here and from here. All right, so this is the general setup of how a recurrent neural network looks like. And in the next video, I want to show you also that we can use this architecture for different types of sequence modeling tasks. And then after that video, I will show you how the backpropagation algorithm works for this type of model.